This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. It's official. Following Tuesday's primaries, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump appear set for a rematch in November after both candidates secured enough delegates to win their party's nomination. This past weekend, Donald Trump hosted Hungary's prime minister, Viktor Orban, at Mar-a-Lago. We, Juan and I, spoke yesterday um, with uh, Hungarian green activists. But first, let's go to uh, President Trump praising Orban at Mar-a-Lago. There's nobody that's better, smarter, or a better leader than Viktor Orban. He's fantastic. As, the, as you know, the prime minister of Hungary, and does a great job. He's a non-controversial figure because he said this is the way it's going to be, and that's the end of it. But right? he's the boss. To talk more about Orban and Trump, we spoke Tuesday with Gabor Schering, visiting fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard University, assistant professor at Georgetown University in Qatar, Green Party member of the Hungarian parliament in 2010 to 14. His new piece headlined, I watched Hungary's democracy dissolve into authoritarianism as a member of parliament, and I see troubling parallels in Trumpism and its appeal to workers. I asked Schering to elaborate on what happened in Hungary and the parallels he sees here in the United States. Indeed, as, as the title uh, suggests, there are quite a few parallels between the United States and, and Hungary. But if we invite what happened in Hungary is basically now the country is the first uh, authoritarian regime, first non-democracy in the European Union. And this democratic backsliding happened under uh, Viktor Orban's uh, leadership, who was elected uh, in 2010 to, to lead the country, which is the same year I was elected to the uh, Hungarian uh, parliament. And back then, we had really high hopes as, as Green Party MPs to, to fix the country's economy and move towards sustainability. We had detailed policy plans. Uh, but within a few years, it became clear that Viktor Orban had, had other plans. He, as he said, he, is, he was building an illiberal state, and there negotiating policy proposals with the opposition was not part uh, of, 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 the, of the big picture. So uh, he basically gradually uh, conquered independent institutions. He stuffed uh, the courts, the public prosecution with his uh, loyalists, so that any misconduct by those in, in power uh, remain hidden. He has built a nationwide conservative uh, media network that, that resembles the, the conservative media network in the U.S., but is even more uh, centralized. He has also used the state to, to kind of uh, pressure uh, investors to, media investors, to, to fall in line. And we have seen examples of Donald Trump while he was in power doing that, uh, pressuring media investors to uh, to, to fall in line with his, with his narratives and, and, and cover him favorably. Um, so these things are, are, are both happening in the two countries, but of course Hungary is much more advanced in, 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 in this uh, process of, of democratic backsliding. But there is certainly a mutual learning going on between the Republicans uh, in, in the U.S. and Viktor Orban's party, uh, Fidesz. Uh, Gabor Shearing, how was it that Orban was able to exercise uh, this uh, increased power? What was the role of the opposition parties or any checks and balances? How exactly did he do it? Yeah, so uh, within a few years, it turned out that basically the, the opposition was was powerless inside the parliament uh, because he was sidelining all the usual democratic uh, mechanisms. He had his own uh, policy team outside uh, the ministries, outside the government machinery. So there was very often very little time to, to discuss his proposals. Sometimes we had to stay late until early in the morning because he introduced something just the day before, and then we had to prepare and, and go for a debate, and then there was voting uh, just the next day. So uh, he, he used the parliament as, a, as, a, as basically a stamping machine from, from early on. But then there are these other institutional aspects, like I mentioned, the media system is, is crucial, uh, the court system, controlling it, 
uh, is, is also crucial. The courts are the last elements where you can still find some, some independence, but Orban has been working quite heavily to, to, to conquer that, that part as, as well. And, and crucially, the prosecution is an important part of it. So that, that, that prosecutor's office makes sure that, that whenever uh, there, there might be anything that is against the law, uh, uh, corruption-wise or, or, or related uh, by government or people affiliated with the government, that that, that thing stays stays hidden. But they can also rewrite the, the law, and, and they do that. They, 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 they have done that. So, you know, they're increasingly not going against the law because the law favors them. Set them. Another element is, is gerrymandering and rewriting local electoral districts. This is something also we know from, from the U.S., uh, uh, the bird itself is coming from the U.S. But he also changed the electoral system in a way that favors Fidesz. So basically, this boils down to uh, uh, subverting democracy from, from the inside without, without necessarily, without, without violence. And that's that what makes this really a big challenge. And this is what these strongmen are doing around the world. They, they don't use the kind of the military anymore to, to subvert democracy, but they do this from, from the inside gradually. And I think uh, this is what's inspiring also for, for, for Donald Trump and, and for other wannabe authoritarian populist uh, leaders, because this gives them like a playbook of how to, uh, how to uh, tilt the democratic playing field in a way that makes, makes, makes the job of the opposition and, and any independent institutions to check them uh, very, very difficult. So I wanted to go to Hungarian um, Prime Minister Viktor Orban in a video posted on social media. Trump shared the video on his Truth Social account. My meeting with President Trump has come to an end. President Trump was a president of peace. He commanded respect in the world and thus created the conditions for peace. During his presidency, there was peace in the Middle East and peace in Ukraine, and there would be no war today if he were still the president of the United States. So that's Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban after um, visiting with Trump in Mar-a-Lago. Um, and I'm looking at your piece as it appears uh, uh, in Common Dreams, uh, Gabor, and <clears throat> its headline, I was there when Orban came to power in Hungary. Here's my warning to Americans about Trump. If the liberal center appears uncaring, authoritarian populists can mobilize voters against both the cultural and economic threats posed by globalization. So you were a Green member of the Hungarian parliament. Now you're in the United States, and you see all of this unfolding. Explain what it is that you're watching with President Trump. Violence used on January 6th, but then, as you say, you don't necessarily need violence to turn a country into an authoritarian regime. Exactly. So, so I think uh, the real power of these authoritarian populists uh, doesn't really lie in the institutions that they hijack, but in the in the new kind of electoral support uh, coalition that they that they that they create. So these are strongmen who, who who promise kind of drama, action, and, and quick solution to, to the problems of of globalization and and the. And the real tragedy is that globalization indeed poses uh, problems that, that parties of the liberal democratic establishment have not been able to solve. And this is what creates a strategic uh, opening for, for uh, authoritarian populists like, like Viktor Orban and, and, and for, for Donald Trump uh, to, to, to attract uh, these, these voters. Like for, for, for a large part of the 20th century, it was parties of the left, the central left social democrats, who provided home, political home for, for workers who wanted more economic security. And during this time, workers cared for democracy, for liberal democracy, because they won uh, also economically when their parties won. But then by the end of the 20th century, parties of the left moved to the right. They became more and more responsive to corporate interests, less and less responsive to, to workers' interests. Uh, so, and this created a situation where really the left and right appear just uh, uh, different shades of the same economic and social uh, policy. And then uh, with globalization, an increasing number of workers were losing out, while the 
became richer and richer, wealthier and wealthier. Um, so this was a situation where, where really the, uh, an increasing number of workers asked themselves, if liberal democracy doesn't care for me, why should I care for, for liberal democracy? But they, what they really want is, is a reform of the economic system. But when they don't see that, that the political establishment deliver uh, those, those reforms, that they kind of become disillusioned with, with the whole uh, political system. So that's really the, the responsibility of, <coughs> of, of uh, the liberal democratic center to not, not really allow the, the, these, these huge masses of voters to, to, to become uh, disillusioned. And, and when, when that happens, then, then these authoritarian populists can really bring together two types of voters. When, when we talk about the radical right, we very often talk about those people who are culturally motivated, motivated by bigotry, motivated by, by racism, and that's certainly part of the picture. But really, the, the successful right-wing populist parties these days bring, bring in, integrate another group, uh, uh, and sometimes, and even this group is, this, this group is even bigger, uh, who are concerned about the economic uh, aspect, the economic threats. Of, of globalization. And they bring these people together by using a kind of nationalist or nativist language and attacking liberal globalization as such, attacking both the cultural liberalism and, and the kind of the economic liberalization aspects. And I think that's a very, uh, very dangerous situation when that happens and when the parties of the la left uh, Allow, allow that happen, that's, that's, the real, that's the real problem. And, and you can see this unfolding um, in the United States with the Republicans becoming a party of the, of the working class. Uh, so really, also in the US, there is this debate whether it's about race, whether it's, it's, it's a white working class problem or not. But I don't see it as a white working class problem. The, the, the Democrats don't have a white or a white working class problem. They have a working class problem. They are losing also non-white voters without college degree, and they have been losing for, uh, for the past, past years. Even Donald Trump has managed to, to, to increase uh, the appeal of his uh, party, of the Republicans, uh, for, for, for non-whites without a college degree. So this is, this is a problem that the Democrats have uh, in, in a sense of their, their declining ability to appeal uh, to, to workers. This, this, this was taking place in Poland. The same happened. The left collapsed because it moved right in, on, on economic policies. And then you had a radical right-wing challenger uh, uh, gaining power, uh, uniting uh, these, these, these people cared both for fearing both the cultural and economic aspects of globalization. But you see it also in, in Western Europe, how increasingly uh, workers in France or many other countries, in Germany certainly, are increasingly voting for, for radical right populists. And that can be a very powerful electoral coalition. And I think that's the most important thing uh, for, for the liberal Democrats or, or those concerned with democracy uh, on the left, uh, but also center right. They need to understand that, that they need to prevent this happening and they need to kind of dismantle this electoral coalition by bringing back in those who are economically disillusioned. But Gabor Shearing, you, you, you say that, uh, uh, that racial animosity is a part but not a, a complete explanation of the rise of these uh, right-wing movements. But all of the movements seem to share in common uh, their opposition to uh, uh, to immigration and and uh, and and, uh, and migration from the global south. So in 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 a large measure, that is a, a clearly a, a racist view because those who are coming, the migrants, are also workers, uh, and they generally all often have the worst jobs in these societies, whether it's the United States, France, Germany, or Hungary. I'm, I'm wondering uh, the, um, the responsibility of those, uh, quote, workers uh, who, who, uh, who rally to these right-wing movements uh, for their own actions. Yes, yeah, so these are not uh, alternative explanations like the culture and the economic, uh, but they, 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 they are intertwined in, in, in different ways. So if you have an increasing number of people disillusioned 
economically sliding down where real wages have been stagnating for workers in the United States for, for decades. The same took place in Hungary for two decades, uh, stagnating real wages. It, but there's even real suffering. We know that in the US, uh, counties with increasing mortality rates are more likely to vote for Donald Trump. In Hungary, the same happened. Uh, uh, local districts and, and uh, uh, counties with increasing mortality in the 90s during the liberal reforms were much more likely to desert uh, the, the left uh, later on. Uh, so we see that this kind of real economic suffering hurting the left and, and pushing people, uh, pushing workers to the, uh, to the right. And then there, the, the, the other problem is if the left is not able to integrate these workers and provide them a kind of identity that talks to their economic pain without blaming immigrants. Right? That, that's what the right is doing. They are, they are claiming that it's because of the migrants. And that's, that's the real problem, because in, in, it, it, those economic problems that the workers feel, they don't come from the migrants. It's coming from inequalities. It's coming from, uh, from, from too much corporate interest over policy making. Uh, and those are the things that, that the left should fix. But then if the left doesn't fix them, then the right comes in and proposes its own right, illiberal solutions, and that, if that's the only thing that the workers see as, as an alternative, then they, then they will go for that. And there are some who are indeed more attracted by the racism aspect, but then there are those who are more attracted by, by Trump's economic nationalism, by when he's saying, I will bring manufacturing jobs back, I will, I will increase, uh, uh, I, mean, I, I, will, I, will, I will create a, jobs here in the US and, and, and not abroad. And, and Viktor Orban is, is doing, the, do, doing the same thing. So these are really interrelated things. And also a lot depends on, on whether there is an alternative, political alternative for, for, for these workers to express, uh, to express their, their anger. Gabor Schering, visiting fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard University, an assistant professor at Georgetown University in Qatar. He was a Green member of the Hungarian parliament from 2010 to 2014. We spoke to him about his new pieces in The Conversation and Common Dreams, the headline, I Watched Hungary's Democracy Dissolve into Authoritarianism as a Member of Parliament, and I See Troubling Parallels in Trumpism and Its Appeal to Workers. Tomorrow on Democracy Now! On Thursday, we'll speak with the acclaimed TV broadcaster and author Mehdi Hassan, who left MSNBC after his show was canceled. One of the most prominent Muslim voices on American television in October, the news outlet Semaphore reported MSNBC had reduced the roles of Hassan and two other Muslim broadcasters on the network. And that does it for our show. Um, coming up next month, I'll be speaking at KPFA's 75th anniversary celebration in Berkeley. I can't wait to see everyone there in person in Berkeley on April 6. Go to democracynow.org for details. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Sharif Abdokadus, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warrenoff, Tarina Nadura, Sam Alkoff, Tamari Astudio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Masood, and Hannah Elias. Our executive director is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagera, Hugh Gran, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, Dennis McCormick, Matt Ely, Anna Ozbeck, Emily Anderson, and Buffy St. Marie Hernandez. To see our podcasts, video and audio, and transcripts of all shows, you can go to democracynow.org. And check us out on Facebook. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.